What I want to do now for a little bit, a few minutes, is talk, apparently, Southwest, uh, what I'm realizing maintain one, 1, is that uh, new pilots who are showing up for um, their private check ride, they don't really know what to expect. And I'm saying they, I'm talking about myself too. When I walked into my private, I had no clue what to expect. It was my first check ride. Um, so I figured, you know what? Let's go ahead and have a little conversation here and talk a little bit about what you can expect. I've gone through close to 10 check rides myself in my life. And um, let's discuss what can be expected on a check ride. Um, and so on and so forth. Uh, just a general idea. Obviously, the first thing I'll say about check rides is that uh, every DPE, which stands for Designated Pilot Examiner, is different. Obviously, different people do things a little slightly different. But, thankfully, we have a document called the ACS, which stands for Airman Certification Standards. And the ACS, this is how I define it to my students. If we think of an airplane, the airplane has a book called the POH, Pilot's Operating Handbook. And if we think of a clever way to explain what the POH is or what its purpose is for, the way I think of it is the POH is a document intended to put the pilot and the airplane on the same page. Essentially, it's just like the operating manual for your car, right? So it's a manual, it's a document which has information in it. And its purpose is in order to bring the pilot and plane sort of together, if you want to think of it that way. It's an odd way to think of it, but uh, it sort of drives the point home. So if we think of a BOH in that way, the question becomes, well, what is the purpose of the ACS? And just like with the POH, the POH's purpose is to bring the pilot and plane to be on the same page. The purpose of the ACS is to bring the pilot and the DPE, the designated pilot examiner, on the same page for the check ride. And here's what I mean. The ACS has very specific items, very specific topics, very specific maneuvers and takeoffs and landings. Very specific stuff. Now, imagine that there were no document and every DPE could show up to the check ride and uh, to their own accord, just do whatever they wanted to do. They could have you do steep turns, they could not. They could have you do steep turns at 45 degrees of bank. They could have you do steep turns at 60 degrees of bank. They could have you do whatever they want. You would see, you would understand, first of all, it would be really difficult to tailor the training environment in general in order to send people to DPEs who just will throw anything at you. So specifically from a flight training standpoint, um, not knowing what's coming, even to a little extent, makes it very difficult for training. Because you could spend months doing everything and then the DPE shows up and he tells you, hey, he asked you a question that you never even heard of. Or what if a DPE showed up and, and they, in their opinion, the question they asked you is suited for a private pilot. But another DPE thinks that that question is suited for a commercial. And so you see how with no standardized anything, something, um, it would be a mess. So the FAA has this document called the ACS, and in there, it specifically specifies all the topics and the information that you, as the pilot, the student pilot, will be tested on and asked about. Now, of course, humans being humans, every DPE might approach, maybe even interpret, and definitely ask the questions in a different way uh, because different people are different people. But at least what the ACS does is it allows the student to show up to the check ride with the knowledge of here's the takeoffs and landings I'll be expected to perform. Here are the uh, tolerances for my steep turns, meaning there's no secrets, nothing, everything's on the table, right? If your tolerance is 45 degrees, and you only go 30 degrees, or if your tolerance is 200 feet on altitude and you lost 400 feet, well, there's no secrets. So the ACS allows 
check rides to be conducted in a much more transparent manner, uh, which is a good thing. That said, let's talk a little bit about what you and your private pilot check ride can expect in terms of um, Number 15 Golf, contact approach 133.65 TF. 33.65, 15 Golf, thanks. And approach station air 1215 Golf, level 9500. Air 1215 Golf, dash approach, show we golf in there, 29085. 29085, 1215 Golf. What you can expect on your private check ride. So, um, your check ride will begin. It's made up of both uh, an oral and an in-flight uh, test uh, portion. So you'll start out on the ground in a classroom and um, you'll spend about, on average, maybe two hours with the examiner. And the first 20, 30 minutes of it is really just about sorting all the eggs uh, and getting your cards lined up in terms of uh, making sure that the FAA's website ha has all their information, that your instructor has signed you off, um, that your logbook looks good, that you have the required cross-country or required aeronautical experience in general, your takeoffs and landings, your nighttime, your uh, solo, uh, so who basically he or she will look through your logbook. And that's really just lining up the ducks in a row to make sure that everything is legal and has take, uh, been taken care of to now be able to execute the check ride uh, in a manner where if you pass, all that's left to do is issue you the certificate. Rather than have you pass, and then they look back and they go, oh, you didn't even get this cross country done, and now you're not even legal, and it doesn't count, and it's a whole headache. So the first 30 minutes of that is uh, uh, lining up the ducks. And then about an hour and a half or two hours will be just you and the examiner in a conversational format and the examiner will just be asking you questions. Um, just to test your general knowledge of regulations, your airplane, and when I say airplane, your systems, um, you know, uh, what happens, uh, how many magnetos does your airplane have? What's the purpose of uh, may, uh, conducting a mag check in the run-up? Uh, what would you do if you saw the RPM drop for more than the allowable uh, tolerance? Um, uh, nothing too crazy. Uh, obviously, each check ride is to its own level of, of knowledge. Um, maybe talk with you a little bit, about, a lot about actually regulations. You know, are you allowed to charge uh, uh, for your services as a private pilot? Um, it, it talk with you a little bit about uh, maybe some night definitions, right? What's what constitutes night? Uh, when could you log nighttime? Blah 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 blah. So, talk to you about that, just in a conversational format look over your nav log, look at your weight balance, and so on and so forth. Uh, by the end of those two hours or so, uh, if you passed and they're happy with your knowledge, uh, at that point, you'll move on to the next stage, and that is you and the examiner will go in the airplane, will go fly. And so the way it works is the oral is first, and only if you pass the oral will you get to the airplane and go fly. Many people, unfortunately, don't pass the oral, uh, I shouldn't say many, but some people don't pass the oral, and um, and so they don't go fly. Uh, they have to redo the oral at another time, and then they will go fly. So the flying is sort of that thing that, think of it as a dessert, but you first have to eat dinner, um, and that's your oral. So once your oral is done, you'll be heading out to the airplane. Obviously, hopefully, before the check ride even began, you'll be making sure that the plane has good oil and fuel, and it has all its certificates in place, its airworthiness, everything's good to go, so you don't show up after your uh, oral and uh, find out that you know someone took the POH um, and it's not there, now you can't go fly. Or there's no fuel, which is fine, you could order, but it's, just, it's more professional, um, and it shows better if you take care of all those things beforehand. Um, at that point, they, some DPEs, actually for private, I would say most DPEs, uh, actually hang out with you during the walk around. Might ask you some questions, you know, about the airplane. What's this antenna? What's that antenna? Tell me about your engine. Um, you know, what's the minimum amount of oil you can see on your dipstick? General operating questions of your airplane. That's just what they're fishing for. They want to see whether or not, you know, you know, what's this thing, the pitot tube, whatever. Uh, what, what is it, you know, what does it do? What, what, what instruments does it provide information to? Again, every DPE will ask different questions, but generally speaking, this is the general thing that you can expect on your private check ride. 
Um, once you're done with that, plane checks, everything looks good, you'll get in the airplane. And guess what? This is the point where the students in their check ride uh, get that big hit to their face in the sense of like, whoa, what just hit me? And that is one of the most difficult transitions you'll ever do as a pilot is transition from being a student pilot to bring, being PIC. And by PIC, I don't mean solo and I don't mean making decisions with your instructor. But what I mean is being that person in the airplane who calls the shots. Now, now, now it's one thing to become a person in a plane who calls the shots. It's a whole other thing to have your first passenger with whom you will be calling the shots a designated pilot examiner. But unfortunately, that's how the system works. And so your first passenger, your first passenger, the first person that you will be calling the shots with in your plane will be the DPE, which could be a little weird, especially if you've just spent six months uh, as the person who always looked to, hopefully your instructor made you make decisions, but as long as you had an instructor in the plane, when something big came down, you looked to them. And so now you're making that transition of becoming the pilot in command, becoming the one in the airplane who's making decisions, who's calling the shots, who's briefing the briefs, um, and who's deciding what, what's going to happen. And so I'll just give you a heads up that if you're, if you're thinking about your check ride from a mental standpoint, anticipate things to feel a little weird when it comes to the airplane and being that pilot in command with the examiner. But that's what they're looking for. It could be a little awkward, but remember, that's what they do for a living. And they're looking to you to see that you're going to make decisions, um, to see that you're a safe pilot, to see that you're actually providing them with the briefing that is legally required of you as a pilot. Um, and so at this point, you, you, you both will get in the airplane and uh, you'll give them a passenger briefing. And I'm sure you've, you've practiced this with your instructor uh, over training. Um, and you'll give them a passenger briefing and you'll tell them how to use the seat belts and as if they're a passenger. And then once you're done with that, you'll say, do you have any questions? No questions. And then you'll get going. You'll do your thing. Most DPEs, as far as I know, are very quiet in the check ride uh, because they're, le they can't, they're not allowed to teach. And so they'll just sit there and observe you. And um, you'll do your thing. You'll get the plane started. And uh, you'll taxi out. You'll do your run-up. They may or may not ask you questions in the run-up. Uh, my specific DP on my private three, loved asking a bunch of questions like in the run-up, specific like when we were doing stuff, so like about the mag check and about the you know different systems of the airplane. But each every DP is different. Um, and then you'll head out to the runway. Ninety percent of private check rides that I know of actually begin with some takeoffs and landings at the airport. So you might do. Um, a normal takeoff, normal landing, and then you might do a short field to a short field, and then you'll depart uh, on your nav log. So you'll have your nav log paper out, and you'll fly the first few waypoints, so top of climb, and you'll be noting, yep, I reached my first waypoint at this amount of time, and I'm this amount, or uh, uh, either ahead or behind what I anticipated. Um, and then you will look at the fuel, and you'll say, okay, I burned uh, uh, point seven gallons on this leg and I plan to burn point eight, so I'm point one ahead of my game. So, and you'll just confirm that, and that's what the nav log is. The nav log is really for you to confirm along your route of flight whether or not you're falling behind or staying ahead of the airplane uh, in terms of fuel and time. Once you do that for a few waypoints, 90% of them will pretty much at that point have you divert and um, tell you, hey, let's divert to such and such airport. Now, typically, if it's around you, you can just hit the nearest button and then do direct enter, enter, and uh, do your whole thing as you trained. Um, they might ask you some questions about what are some things to consider, you know, how would you know that the runway length is sufficient, whatever it might be, they'll ask you some questions, and they'll say, how much fuel will you burn, how long will it take you to get there, what heading will you turn to, whatever. Um, after that, pretty much, once they're happy with your diversion, you won't land at that airport. You'll pretty much head out and do some maneuvers. So you'll do the steep turns, the stalls, the slow flight, um, emergency procedures. Um, and once they're happy with all that, again, they're not looking for perfection. Remember, uh, you're a private pilot, and that's sort of the first stage when it comes to flying airplanes. Now, unfortunately, from your perspective as the private pilot, let's see, temperatures look good. Let's close this. 
from your perspective as the private pilot, when you're getting your private, you don't yet know how little you know because everything seems like a lot. Uh, the thing I learned the most during instrument was how little I knew through private or how little I knew lead, uh, getting out of private. But you don't really know how little you know until you learn more. Um, so from your perspective, it's like, what do you mean this is a little? This is so much. It is a lot. But the expectations of a private pilot, as it should be, are not as high as some higher level certificates, uh, which makes sense. So again, no one's looking for perfection. No one is looking for everything to be perfect. Everyone understand that you're new to this. Uh, everyone understand that you're nervous. You're in a check ride. There's a DPE sitting next to you. Um, everyone understand all that. And all that is taken into account. We're human beings, we're not robots. Uh, that being said, all that is no excuse for not being safe, not briefing your passenger, not thinking, uh, you know, um, you can your about the operation in a safe and as a pilot in command should. Um, so while there's excuses to a lot of things, uh, being new to all this is not an excuse to uh, not being safe or being uh, negligent um, and just sort of uh, winking things. You don't want to do that, especially not on a check ride. Um, so that's really what they're looking for. That's really what um, that's really what um, we're fishing for in terms of um, uh, private pilots' proficiency and ability to fly an airplane. Um, even as an instructor. Um, when I sign a student off to the check ride, I'm not looking for perfection. If I looked for perfection, some people would never be signed off for the check ride. Um, I wasn't perfect on my check ride, and few people are. Uh, in fact, probably no one is. Uh, so keep that in mind. It's really just about making the examiner walk away from your check ride feeling like, you know what? This person is, is a person who is open to learn. This person is a person who wants to get better and better themselves and be a safe pilot and do their very best every day. That's what we're shooting for. And that's what it comes down to. At the end of the maneuvers, uh, you'll be doing your ground ramps. You'll do the emergency procedures. Once you're done with all that, um, you'll be heading back to the airport and then you'll be doing a um, soft field landing. Again, I'm just talking in general. Each examiner might mix the stuff up and do your landings here, your landings there, but pretty much they're all... Uh, uh, well, most check rides do it in a certain order that kind of makes sense and it's streamlined. Um, at that point, if you fail anything, you will know about it immediately in the flight. So if you don't hear that you failed, uh, you should assume that you passed because they have to tell you that something wasn't satisfactory if it's not. Um, and then you'll obviously have the choice to continue or discontinue um, or terminate the check ride, but you, they'll have to tell you if, if you didn't pass. Uh, so if you don't hear anything, you pretty much pass the check ride and then you get back to the airport. Uh, but again, remember, the check ride isn't over until the plane is shut down and secure and uh, you're back in the, in the uh, FBO and you shook hands and you got your certificate. Don't say anything stupid when you're sitting in the room and you're, the DPE is printing out the certificate. Again, remember, your goal is to make this person feel like you're a safe pilot. And so if you say anything that might make them think, you know, this, this person's a little, I don't know about giving them a certificate, don't do that. And that's about that. You walk back in, they'll print out a certificate, they'll sign it, it'll be a temporary one, you'll get your certificate, and then uh, within, a, I believe it's two months or so, uh, you'll get your plastic card uh, mailed to your address. And that's about it, you're a pilot, and immediately after your check ride, a minute later, you could get in the plane and take your friends and go flying, and you, you're, you're, that uh, uh, a temporary certificate is, is your, it's your, it's your certificate. And that's all there is to it. Um, Really, it's a cool experience. There's not much to it. It's probably, once you pass your check ride, it's probably going to be the most excited feeling you've experienced in either a long time or ever. Uh, it's really, really, really cool. I wish I could feel that feeling again uh, with passing a check ride. But even the check rides that come after, they don't quite hit the, uh, hit the mark as the first one does because that first one is just like, if you think about getting, becoming a private pilot, you just stepped into a, a world that is new, a brand new world, and it's like learning a new language, and you mastered this big thing, and you passed the test. It's an amazing, amazing feeling. So, I hope this is helpful. I hope it gives you a little bit of insight as to what the general look of your private pilot check ride will look like. Um, 
And that's about that. Again, remember, everyone's different, but we have the ACS. Use the ACS. The ACS is a phenomenal tool. And if you ask me, your entire training should be familiarizing yourself with the ACS. ACS, tolerances, whatever it might be, because you don't want to show up to your check ride and not know what, how, to, how to fly a short field. So, of course, you'll train with your instructor and the whole thing, but you really want to make sure that you study the ACS and that you walk into the check ride knowing what's expected of you. And that, too, shows professionalism, right? Um, you're not looking to the DPE to teach you stuff. So I hope this is helpful. And uh, as always, if you have any questions, you feel free to send me an email. Leave a comment in the comment section below. Um, as always, these topics that I talk about are things that I get emails from people. Um, so if you have any topic of your own that you want me to discuss, shoot me an email. And uh, I do my best to cover them on my flights uh, whenever I have the time to do so. So. Hope this is helpful and keep moving on with training. Uh, stick with it. I know it can get a little difficult. And uh, eventually a day will come where you'll find yourself just like this in a plane flying over the desert and um, either talking to a camera or not. But either way, it's, uh, it's incredible. So I hope that was helpful. And uh, we will begin our descent here in a moment to Trona. Here we go.